Welcome everyone. My name is Shirley and I will be your moderator this evening. I am excited to welcome Dr. Greb, Greg Grobmeyer as our speaker tonight for three ways to maximize CDT codes. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to go over some quick housekeeping. If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A section and we will answer them live at the end of the webinar. CE is not available for this webinar, live or in demand. Dr. Grobmeyer, welcome and thank you so much for being with us tonight. I will pass it over to you now. Great. Well, I thank you so very much. Well, it was a pleasure to get to speak with you. We were catching up a little bit about uh, her travels and where she's been. I'm down in Tennessee. She's up in New York City. So uh, quite some distance away, but we we share some, some commonality and some of the things we've seen and done. So nice to get to know you too. Thank so you. Guys, tonight we're going to be talking about three ways to maximize CDT codes. And so I'm going to bail off into that in just a moment. I want to make sure everybody's kind of joining that wants to be able to join. And so I'm going to give it just a minute there on that. But uh, I, I greatly appreciate you joining me for this evening. And I hope we cover some really good material that you'll be able to walk away with and begin to use directly in your practice. So Let's just talk a little bit first about our sponsors before we even begin. Uh, we are sponsored tonight by eAssist, eAssist Dental Solutions. Now, they are uh, a company, you may know them as a dental billing outsource company. Uh, they say they optimize the revenue cycle management and front office services for dentists. Uh, they're a great uh, solution to issues of staffing. They're a great solution to take some of the pressure off of the members that are at your front desk, your admin team. They've been working for well over a decade now to put money back in the pockets of the nation's dentists to reduce stress and to create reliable cash flow. Now, here's the cool numbers to date. The dental billing specialists at eAssist have uh, the, the dentists that have been using their platform. They've collected more than $12 billion dollars from insurance companies and got it back into the hands of dentists. Now, so that's uh, helping with those collections, uh, helping with uh, a lot of different services. In fact, let's go over some of those. These are some things that eAssist helps do. Now you probably know them as an insurance billing and aging company. That was their original creation. That was the, the purpose, Dr. Anderson that created this. Uh, noticed a void. He realized that this was happening in medical, but it wasn't really happening. There wasn't really a player in the dental field that was doing what they do. So he stepped in. He was really the first to pioneer this for dentistry. And since then, it has grown to be a, 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 a huge part of uh, the dental industry. And it's now a part of Henry Shine and uh, the services that they offer. And so again, dental insurance filing uh, so they'll do the claims. They make sure that everything is, you know, once you've got it batched, everything is submitted correctly. All the attachments are there, that all the coding is correct. They're, they're following up and making sure that things are as they should be uh, before they submit things. And they do this very, very well. So in addition to that, their core competency, they also do a lot of other stuff. They do insurance verification and eligibility. So you're not having to pay some staff member to sit on the phone for an hour listening to a uh, hold message while they're waiting to get a CSR on the phone. So insurance verification, that's a great service that they offer. Um, that's a huge time saver. They also do credentialing. They do uh, uh, patient portion statements and billing. So they're going to be... Uh, uh, trying to chase down any money that's outstanding. They do the collections, they'll do the collection calls for you, which can be kind of uncomfortable for some people uh, within your practice. They can take care of that. They do accounting, they do bookkeeping, they do payroll. Now these are services you may have a local CPA doing, but ESist is dental specific. They are the specialist. And so just like referring out to the endodontist for the root canal that seems challenging, these guys do this and they do only this and they do it very well. And so that's uh, extremely helpful. So uh, as I mentioned, they do do credentialing for new uh, dentists that may be joining the practice. And they also have a program called Full Schedule, which does patient recall and retention. Uh, they're reactivating patients that are in the, in the practice that have outstanding work to be done. Um, they're putting them back on the schedule and they're getting butts in seats, which is 
such a crucial thing to be keeping a, an active and uh, profitable practice. You got to have people in the chair. So eAssist is able to help you with all of those things. We'll be talking kind of at the end about how to get a hold of them uh, to be able to help you with some of these services. So a little about me uh, before we dive off into it too much. I'm Dr. Greg Grobmeyer. I'm uh, I work a lot with eAssist Dental Solutions. My primary company, as you see in my little thing up here, is Practice Booster. Practice Booster is Dr. Charles Blair's company. So uh, I got to come on. Let's see. I was a practicing dentist for a decade, uh, 10 years in West Tennessee. Uh, I ended up going through a cancer battle when I was 36 years old and uh, ended up with numb fingers and numb feet. I can't do the clinical practice the way that uh, I used to. Nobody wants to go to a dentist that drops things. So kind of shifted over. I, I did practice management consulting for a long time. Uh, stepped out of that and got into writing for the for the industry. Uh, got to write for a lot of the trade mags and journals and blogs and websites, but also got to write for a lot of uh, patient facing stuff, uh, even into Reader's Digest and New York Magazine and Men's Health and Slate and um, a lot of a lot of fun things like that. So I got to write for those organizations. Dr. Blair was looking for someone to take over the newsletter that uh, Practice Booster puts out every other month. And so I came in as the chief editor of that uh, publication, been doing that uh, for the last several years, and slowly I've begun. I'm now the chief editor also of the Coding with Confidence manual. And so you guys, I hope, are familiar with that book. That's a uh, uh, a great resource for you to be able to look up any of the particular codes that you want to see that explains them in depth, what to do, what not to do, what the attachments should be, the documentation should be, uh, commonly confused codes. Um, and so really, really goes into depth explaining how the CDT codes should be used, uh, including all the updates that happen to the code. So that we rewrite the book every single year. So that's a great opportunity for me uh, to be able to, to, to put my spin on that as well. And I've been doing that for several years now. So I'm the chief editor of those and uh, happy to be with your, you here tonight, actually presenting on this webinar. So do a lot of this as well, a lot of speaking and one-on-one -on -one coaching and consulting as well. So disclaimer for the evening, coding is as I say it today. Like I said, the CDT code changes uh, regularly. And so we're wanting to make sure that as of tonight, uh, and so uh, May 9th of 2023, this is accurate to the best of our knowledge and our ability. Uh, you come back and watch this in a year, uh, things may have changed. So what I'm saying is true and accurate only as of today. Always code for what you do. That's the golden rule of coding. Don't make something up. Don't elaborate or enhance uh, what it is that you did in order to try to increase reimbursement, that can really get you in trouble. Uh, follow the CDT code set to the best of your ability. And I did want to say I'm not an attorney. That's the stuff that's in the circle there that's just saying we're not giving legal advice. This is giving advice uh, from, from our breadth of knowledge. But if you do want legal advice, please consult a healthcare attorney. So moving on, let's get into the meat of it. Let's talk about the things we're going to discuss tonight. Um, three things. We're going to talk about navigating the confusing world of insurance uh, and the CDT coding. There's some new technology and some changes to existing technology that have happened. I'm going to discuss a few of those points tonight uh, and, and tell you how to code those things and what they are. So we're going to discover some tools to keep in compliance. Now, this is about documentation, avoiding audits, and maximizing legitimate reimbursement, okay? Legitimate reimbursement. We're not wanting anything fraudulent, anything that's fabricated. We're playing by the rules, but we're wanting to make sure that within those rules, we are maximizing and providing strategies for uh, increasing your reimbursement. Lastly, we're going to make sure that you're putting in clean claims. And so the, the claims need to be good on the front end to make sure there are no delays, denials, or other problems that are log jamming your practice and keeping you uh, from getting paid in a timely manner. So those are the things that we're talking to you about tonight. And that's mainly, um, so we're talking 
coding, we're talking documentation, and we're talking uh, about clean claims. So do you guys use, I want to take a poll here, okay? And do you guys use any type of a coding resource? It could be uh, our materials, the Coding the Confidence book. It could be things from the ADA. Are you using updated materials to maximize reimbursement and uh, minimize risks? So this is this is a question. Uh, you should be seeing the poll pop up on your uh, screen there. If you guys could answer just yes or no. Are you using something within your office that's going to be helping you and that it's up to date? Do you guys know if it's up to date? Is it is it current as of today? We're going to be talking about why that's so critical here in a moment. So give you a moment to make sure you're locked in your answers. Cheryl, are you getting them to flow through there? How's it looking? How are those poll answers coming through? Yep. So I just closed it there. They came in. Okay. Awesome. Can you tell me kind of what percentage or how, how does it look? Does it look more yeses, more noes? Yeah. So mostly yeses to the question of, do you currently use a coding resource to help you maximize reimbursement and minimize risk? 83% of respondents answered yes and 17% answered no. Fantastic. I'm very glad to hear that. Uh, honestly, a lot of times we'll be in practices and their coding books are several years old. Okay. Uh, they're, they're not really aware of what the updates are. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. I'm getting ahead of myself. So, um, did you know that even if you are fee for service, CDT coding still matters. Documentation still matters. Reporting correctly still matters. Even if you're not in contract with anybody. You even have the potential for audit from payers if you are uh, submitting in any way. You don't even have to be in network with people. You can be out of network and still open uh, to audits. Audits are not just to check what you did and submit it to the particular insurance. They're also wanting to make sure that, that uh, state and national standards are being met. They're wanting to look and make sure that uh, treatment build was necessary that it met the standard of care according to the definitions and that it was reported accurately. So uh, there's a misconception that coding is for insurance submission and that's a secondary or even tertiary reason for coding, okay? Accurate CDT coding, it's if you read from ADA what they state, it is predominantly a language it is a language that is used to communicate between all the different people that are in the, the continuity of care of that patient. We're making sure that we're all saying the same thing, that we're all speaking about the same treatment. Uh, the, so when we're discussing things, that accurate CT code needs to be there so that everyone down the line knows exactly what was done that day and that it was coded correctly. So, and you are subject to this. You're uh, when you're when you're signing any of those claim forms, whether it be in network or out, you are attesting that to the best of your knowledge and the best of your belief, this is the procedure that I provided today, and uh, and that this is the truth. I'm I'm telling the truth. I'm not uh, lying or exaggerating or, or or making something up. That uh, this is what it should be. And so, uh, to the best of your ability, you need to be using the CDT codes when appropriate. Uh, if there are some codes that don't fit, there's some catch-all codes, those CDT 999 unspecified codes. Those can go in there. Uh, and the things that anytime there's a charge, if you're in network with somebody, you need to be reporting uh, the charges that you've made to that patient. Uh, you're normally contractually obligated to do so. So uh, know that uh, you're not going to just be randomly audited. More than likely, audits happen because of certain patterns, but you'd be amazed how, how easy it is to fall in certain patterns. They're looking at particular ratios of surgical to non-surgical extractions, especially if you're not an oral surgery practice. They're looking at the ratio of uh, core buildups to crowns. They're, they're, they're looking at these things, and they're trying to determine uh, particular patterns in your practice and in your filings that seem to fall outside of the norm 
of what the national averages are. And if they can all, if they find something that flags them and they go into your practice, then they're looking at everything, okay? They may not just be looking at the one thing that originally brought them in. If they're on site, they're gonna start looking at documentation. They're gonna start looking at, uh, do you, all your x-rays meet the requirements of being valid and, and certifiably true? Do uh, you have all the documentation present to be able to say that you truly coded the things that you did? If it doesn't meet both the nomenclature and the descriptor of those CDT codes, and meet all the check boxes that fall under those things in your documentation, then it didn't happen. And when you're audited, they're able to take money back. We don't want them taking money back, okay? So make sure that you're, you're doing everything in accordance to those CDT codes. So this is my mentor, Dr. Blair. Dr. Blair says correct coding often results in higher revenue as practices obtain reimbursements that were once unpaid because of misunderstanding or misreported codes. So often, uh, money's getting left on the table because you're coding incorrectly, okay? Or you're documenting incorrectly, or you're calling something different from what it was. And when these circumstances arise, it's gonna impact your bottom line. We're gonna try to teach you a little bit tonight about some tools that can help uh, get around that. So I uh, talked about changes to the CDT code set, okay? Uh, this year alone, 2023, there are 38 changes, okay? Last year, there were uh, 46 changes. The year before that, there were 61 changes. If you guys have not updated your coding books or your coding resources since the pandemic, you're talking 160 codes that have changed over that period of time, 160 codes. And these are codes that are not weird things. There's some, many of them are very common codes that you guys are using on a regular basis. And so I wanna make sure that you are uh, aware of and are updating the resources that are there. Uh, you need to be going into your practice management system, locking out or deleting those old codes that are no longer valid, making sure that the proper new codes are put into the practice management system so that you're using the right things and you're not accidentally doing miscodes, calling stuff, uh, things that they aren't. I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching through our revenue enhancement program where I'll actually look at a practice. We 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 look at the, uh, the coding reports that you guys do over the course of a year. I go line by line down the coding for an office and make sure that they're valid codes, they're being used correctly. Uh, you're not using any uh, outdated or deleted codes. Uh, we also do fee analysis and check and make sure things are being priced the way they should be. But you wouldn't believe, I, I don't think I've ever gone into a practice that was doing everything as they should. There's always some deleted codes. There's always some miscoding. Um, it, it's invariable that this happens. So uh, you may think you're doing everything right. I would bet not. I mean, just, just uh, from the amount of practices that I've gotten to personally look at, I've yet to find one that's doing everything correct. So here's one of the changes, and this is a new technology that's come out. So that's uh, we've talked about, uh, there's a lot of these changes that were over here, okay? Uh, there's a lot of changes that have happened uh, recently uh, in the last year or two. There's changes to the perio codes, there's changed to oral surgery codes, there's changes, um, uh, the 210 FMX code changed this year. Uh, the way that you use palliative changed this year. Uh, 4355, the debridement code changed a lot this year in the way that you can use that code. Uh, they tweaked it twice. They changed it and they changed it again. And so if you guys are not aware of those changes, we have covered most of those things in some prior uh, webinars and, and lectures. Uh, the, all the information is also in the coding resources, the books and everything. And so I'm not going to get into those particular codes, but there's some very frequently used codes. Today, I'm going to be talking about some things that are new and different and changing. The first one of these was this. This is the intraoral tomosynthesis. Most of you probably are not aware of intraoral, stationary intraoral tomosynthesis is what it's called. Um, this is a particular technology. It's a, uh, a radiography method 
that has been used in mammography for a very long time. It's made its way over into dentistry. In mammography, it was much like a CBCT. It went around the patient, took a lot of different pictures from different ways. Um, they, uh, the, uh, some very smart people at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill have uh, created a stationary version of this. And the thing looks like the x-ray head that's probably already hanging in your office. It's a, um, uh, in your operatories right now, you've got a mobile x-ray head on, a, on an arm. You've got a, a sensor that's an intraoral sensor. Uh, the stuff looks like that. It looks the same. But so it takes a PA or a bite wing, much like your a number two sensor would uh, that you'd be using in, uh, in digital radiography. But the cool thing about this, that x-ray head has a carbon nanotubule collimator inside. So it divides that x-ray into uh, the x-ray source into seven separate beams, which are coming from slightly different angulations. That sensor can then read those different beams, identify which one is which, and it puts together seven slices of tooth that can be scrolled through from buccal to lingual. So we're talking about it's not like a CBCT that's completely three-dimensional. It's slices of a tooth. But when you've got that situation, if you've got... Uh, one root, you want to just see that palatal root. I'm an endodontist and I'm looking for that one root. I can scroll through that tooth until that one root is isolated, see it absolutely clearly without any other overlaps, any obstructions, anything in the way. There's a big buccal amalgam on the, a big facial amalgam on a, on a tooth. You can scroll to a level where that amalgam is not visible. If there is overlaps uh, between contacts, you can scroll to a level where those contacts are not overlapping, so you don't have those artifacts. You can clearly see decay in places where you couldn't before. You can see fractures a lot of times. You can isolate particular roots. You can look for periapical pathology very easily. Uh, you can scroll to the level where bone levels are the lowest and, uh, and be, be using that as your images for periodontal uh, treatment. And so really, really cool technology. Um, it's by a company called Surround uh, Medical, Surround Medical out of uh, North Carolina. And the, um, it's called the Portray system, P-O-R-T-R-A-Y. So if that's something you guys want to be interested in, you can take a look. Um, it doesn't do everything that a CBCT does, but it does so much more than a 2D image does. It's kind of in the middle. It fits a gap there. Uh, and it's much less expensive than like a CBCT would be uh, if that's, you know, the, the, the limitations of your practice and that's all you need to have. So really cool tool. Let's zip on. The definition of porcelain ceramic changed this year. And this is significant for a reason. Um, prior to 2012, there was uh, the definition of porcelain ceramic basically said if there was any resin in it at all, you couldn't call it porcelain ceramic. They changed the, uh, the uh, fill requirements that particular year in order to make way for lava crowns. Y'all remember lava crowns? So for lava crowns to be able to be called porcelain ceramic, they altered the definition of porcelain ceramic. And it used to say refers to the whole thing here, pressed, fired, milled, polished, or milled materials containing predominantly inorganic refractory compounds. So this year, what they've done is they've taken out those fabrication requirements. They took out pressed, fired, polished, or milled. Now, what this means is that you can now 3D print porcelain ceramic restorations as long as they meet these particular specifications. There are several companies out there. Uh, I worked closely with Sprint Ray on the particular thing, but there are several other companies out there that also have uh, materials that are beginning to meet this, this qualifier, this, this uh, uh, type of material. Uh, and so they are considered a ceramic material. Um, so if it's greater than 50% filled with inorganic fillers, including porcelains, glasses, ceramics, glass ceramics, um, then you can now call that a porcelain ceramic restoration. So absolutely, you're able to do an inlay, an onlay, 
single unit crowns if they're not a Bruxer, you know, in appropriate places. And you're talking you know, five, 10 bucks worth of material uh, to be able to do this in 30 minutes of chair time. You scan it, you print it out in about a half hour, you're able to deliver it. And so much less expensive than milling, probably not as strong as milled zirconia. I'll give you that. Uh, and we have yet to see, you know, long-term how these things are going to last, how polishable they are, their wear resistance, their fracture resistance, things like that uh, in the mouth. But uh, it's very, very positive. These materials are going to get better and better and better too as they are refined. They're brand new. Uh, so expect to be able to see this going forward. And your lab bills are like nothing. Your lab bills are nothing to be able to create these porcelain ceramic restorations. So really cool if you guys haven't invested in a 3D printer, now may be the time to consider doing that. There's so many different things you can do with that within your office now, including printing porcelain ceramic restorations. So some more changes that happened this year, all the membrane code changes, okay? Uh, they all changed. If uh, our, originally we had the, the 4266, and the 4267. 4266 used to state guided tissue regeneration and it was for resorbable. 4267 was GTR for non-resorbable. And those were the two. You used those in everything. You used those in every circumstance with the exception there is a code over in, um, it's the 3432 code that's over in Indo for periradicular surgery. So aside from that one, which is kind of an odd bird, most people aren't using, these were the two membrane codes. We used them in all circumstances. Well, this year, CDT took those two and busted them out into seven, seven codes. So you probably have taken a photo by now uh, or a screenshot of this particular slide. Uh, if it's around natural teeth, you've got a couple of codes for that now, resorbable and a non-resorbable variant. Around implants, there's two different codes. So if the if it's the first one's going to be basically in perio surgery, you're retaining the tooth, you're trying to solve a periodontal defect. That's where you're going to be using it. those first two. Second ones, you're doing uh, bone grafting at the time of implant placement or some type of uh, uh, surgery around the implant that's existing. Um, you're going to be using those two codes. The edentulous areas, ones these that are down in the surgical section, this is for edentulous areas, and that also includes something you just made edentulous, meaning if you pull a tooth and you're doing the bone grafting for ridge preservation code, uh, that would be an appropriate time to be able to use one of these codes as the membrane that goes along with that code. So you'll notice again a resorbable and a non resorbable barrier. And for the first time ever, they now have a removal code for the non-resorbable barrier. This is new for 2023. They haven't had this before. And this is applicable in every single one of the non-resorbable barrier variants. So all three of those, you use the 4286 code for the removal of that barrier now. So that's that. There were so many more changes. I just hit up on a few. Like I said, 38 this year alone. Uh, this is just a few of them. 46 last year, 61 the year before, 160 total changes over three years. If you guys were not aware of these, and you're probably not aware of some other ones too. And uh, like I said, palliative, uh, 4355 debridement code, the FMX code changed. Go out and look that stuff up. Make sure that you're using things correctly according to the new definitions and criteria, okay? So let's move on from coding to the next little part, which was documentation, okay? Documentation is a critical aspect of your practice, not only for continuity of care and just remembering what you did last time and what you're planning on doing next time. That's, that's wonderful in the office. It's a great way to communicate between uh, the doctor, the, the other clinical team, the people that are in hygiene, uh, the people at the front desk, they all need to know these things, okay, uh, about what happened on the patient that day. And there's very specific things that need to be documented, okay? On top of 
just the continuity of care and making sure that it, within the office, everybody knows what's going on. There's other critical aspects. Um, knowing that not only within the office, when you're referring out, you've got people that are looking at your chart notes, okay? When uh, patients themselves are now actually able to get copies of the uh, documentation in a much easier way than they used to. There was a uh, recent legislation called uh, the uh, uh, One Notes, which is part of the 21st Century Cure Act. And uh, that uh, part requires unfettered access of the patient to their chart notes. Okay, right now that means if they ask for them, you have to give them to them. Uh, but I also foresee that being much like medical, where in the future, right now I can pick up my telephone, I can look at an app on my phone, and I can look at the doctor's visit that I just had uh, just a day or two ago. I can check my test results. I can see what they wrote about me in the charts. Uh, I'm able to, to look that stuff up right from the comfort of my own home. At some point, dental will probably be that way too. And then you've got the situation of patients who are just bored at the house looking at uh, what's written in their chart. Now, is what's written in their chart full, complete, and accurate? Um, and is there anything derogatory in there? Make sure that you're watching out for statements like PITA. You think they don't know what that means? They know what that means. People text to these days and they use every little initialism under the sun. They understand what those things mean. It could be intentional like that. It could be also if you're saying the patient is short of breath and you say patient is SOB, okay? You may not be thinking of those things, but it can be misconstrued by patients. So you have to be conscious of what you're putting down in those chart notes. They have to be thorough. They have to be accurate. They have to stay uh, very middle of the road. You want to be Switzerland when you're writing these chart notes, okay? You can make personal notes about what you know they're into, but make sure that there's nothing in there that's derogatory or could even be construed as derogatory, okay? Documentation is not just chart notes. Chart notes is part of it, okay? What you're writing in the chart is very critical, needs to be thorough, needs to be complete. We're going to talk a little bit about what uh, that should look like. But also radiographs, photos, these are things that are, that are helping with documentation. When your uh, radiographs must be ordered by the clinician, they must be of clinical accuracy. They've, they've got to make sure that you know, they meet the requirements. A uh, PA has got to show the apex, bite wings can't have overlaps, those kind of rules, uh, and you know what they are. Um, and they must be, then uh, the findings must be noted in the chart as well. So you must note that the doctor ordered the particular x-rays because it is a medical procedure that needs to be in your documentation. The, they need to be of clinical accuracy and they need to be, uh, the findings need to be recorded as well. So all that needs to be in there. Photos, especially intraoral photos. You go to try to do a claim on a, um, uh, a buildup and you show a photo just of the shell of the tooth that's left after full preparation and decay removal, nothing is better for getting that claim paid than showing that little piece of a tooth that's remaining, okay? It's hard to argue with that photograph. So uh, photos for documentation are especially good. You're doing 40 through 55, you're doing uh, debridement, show a picture of the calculus wall on the back of those teeth. Uh, if you're doing uh, uh, 43, 46, you're doing, uh, someone's got generalized gingivitis. You can show the bleeding gums, the puffiness, you know, that's not going to show up on those radiographs. The radiographs are going to show by definition, no bone loss. So to be able to prove that there's gingivitis, that there's gingival inflammation, show a picture of the bloody gums. I know it's kind of gross, but pull out that intraoral camera, use it. It's the best tool in your office, not only for, uh, patient in engagement and enrollment and care, you know, because seeing is believing. They believe it when they see the big nasty tooth in their mouth. But it's also fantastic for documentation purposes, both for getting claims paid and heaven forbid if anything ever came down uh, from a legal aspect. So periodontal charting, tooth charting, these are all parts of documentation. You're wanting to make sure that all your perio stuff has 
uh, bleeding points. It has pocket depths. It's got clinical attachment loss, which is different from your pocket depths. And uh, it's also got radiographic evidence of bone loss. Uh, a lot of insurance payers are now using AI. They're using artificial intelligence to look at the images that you're sending in. So if you're sending in Im images, uh, you're sending in a bite wing, it's a little off angle, okay? You're not gonna see the bone loss. That, uh, that AI, the computer system is not gonna read that pocket depth the same way that you are. Make sure that those things are perfectly uh, at 90 degrees. If they're perpendicular, you're gonna be able to see the pocket depth and the true bone loss. If that is skewed, the computer may kick it out. I'm seeing denials now for SRP on perfectly probably appropriate patients because the documentation was not correct. You didn't include particular things uh, like the clinical attachment loss or that the radiographs themselves were not of diagnostic quality to show the bone loss. It has to be visible. It has to be visible. Okay. Appropriate narratives. Now, in our books, we talk about which what narratives need to say to, to go along with in, individual procedures. Uh, one particular thing about narratives I'd like to include uh, in this talk, uh, 80 characters. That's all you got on box, the box 35. It's the remarks section on the 2019 ADA claim form. Uh, you have 80 characters that include spaces and punctuation. If you write more than that, and it will allow you to, it'll allow you to write just paragraphs and paragraphs. If you write more than that, the only only the first 80 characters are absolutely guaranteed to get all the way through the clearinghouse and to the person reading it on the other end, on the claims adjuster himself. So if you've got a long narrative, do it as an attachment. Don't do it just as in the claim box. Short stuff, no problem. Uh, there's the possibility of it being auto-adjudicated, the computer looking at it, looking at particular for particular keywords. Uh, and it not seeing a real person. Uh, but uh, if you're doing it as an attachment, there's a little more to it, then usually you're actually going to get human eyes on that thing as well. So that's that's a great uh, uh, trick for you there. So why is this documentation so important? I talked a little bit about continuity of care. That's the keeps everyone on the same page thing. We're wanting to make sure that that, that is uh, not only within the office, between what the doctor diagnosed and what the hygienist does and what the front desk person submits to claims. Um, it's also keeping people on the same page as far as the oral surgeon who looks at it next. And then, heaven forbid, this first point protects and defends. Remember I said that more and more patients are going to be looking at their charts? Okay, who else is looking at those charts when something's funny? attorneys, okay? I expect to see an uptick in malpractice suits against dentists, okay? And usually that's going to be against people that are not documenting thoroughly. Uh, gone are the days where you can write, would you could write uh, uh, PFM shade A3 and that be sufficient. You can't do that anymore. You need to be documenting uh, everything along the way about what you did, why you did it, uh, lots of steps to it. There are templates out there. Uh, we've got a documentation book, actually, that shows thorough subnotes. I'm going to discuss subnotes in a minute for every single category of service. So how to how to write these things and make sure that you're including everything that needs to be said. Uh, so it's not just for you. It's now it's also protecting you. It should be written as if you were thinking about protecting yourself from a lawsuit that's happening five years from now when you don't remember this interaction even happening. You should be able to look back in five years uh, and see what you did and it all be there. And if it's not in that note, then legally it didn't happen. So there are particular codes that have certain aspects, like I said, little check boxes that need to get ticked in order to be able to use the code. If you're ever audited, you know, I'm not even talking lawyers and stuff. If you're just audited by an insurance company and they look and you're not meeting all the requirements of a specific code, they can take the money back on that code, okay? If you're not doing all the things I just said on your, your radiograph, it's not uh, written in there that, you're, that you've uh, uh, requested those x-rays to be done, okay? If your findings are not written down, uh, if those things are not in there, 
then they have the potential of taking back money off of those radiographs. If they're not of diagnostic quality, they'll look and see what percentage, they'll pull 10 charts and they'll see what percentage of these are not diagnostic quality. And they'll take that number and they will extrapolate it over every single patient that that insurer has in, within the practice. And they'll go back six years and take that amount of money uh, out of your pocket. And we don't want to see that happen. So documentation is critical. If you've got good documentation, auditors are hesitant to mess with you. Okay. Uh, more and more, they're asking for documentation of the complete chart notes for date of service. Have you seen this? Instead of just a narrative for a particular treatment, they're asking for the entire chart note for the date of service. And so when those circumstances arise and you're having to send in the whole chart note, well, the insurers are looking at your whole chart. They're looking at everything you're writing down. If your chart notes and documentation are sloppy, that's flagging you for audit. They know if they go into your office, they're going to be able to collect some money from you. If your documentation is thorough and solid and good, they're going to leave you alone because they know it's going to be an uphill battle. It's going to be a fight they don't want to fight. It's not worth their time. So let's look at some of that proper documentation. We discussed SOAP notes. SOAP is just an acronym. This is uh, something that's been used in medicine for a very long time. You may be familiar with it. They are teaching this now in dental schools. Uh, you younger guys probably were doing it this way in dental school. And so the templates that you have within your computer can follow this particular format and make sure that you're including these different parts when you're doing a patient appointment. Uh, but just make sure that those templates are not saying the same thing patient after patient after patient after patient. They need to be customized. They need to be specific to the patient that is in the chair, okay? And so every template is just a starting point. It is a guide. It is an outline. It helps you remember what all you need to include, but they absolutely need to be uh, customized for each and every patient interaction to accurately reflect what went on during that appointment. So soap notes. The first part is subjective. Subjective is anything that the patient's telling you, okay? So, and you don't have to write subjective objective assessment plan in your, you can, but in your, in your template, as long as you're including these different parts in what you're writing, okay? And again, we do have a documentation book that has different categories of service, different procedures, examples of what some good thorough soap, soap notes should look like. So uh, you can research that on practicebooster.com. It's in our store. It's our dental documentation with confidence book. Uh, subjectives, again, anything the patient is telling you. So they're coming in, they're complaining about this. This is chief complaint. This is history of what's going on with them. It's uh, where it's hurting, how long it's been hurting, what makes it hurt, what makes it go away. Those are all things that are subjective, things they tell you. Objective are the things that you observe, okay? So the tests that you run, the things that you see, their vital, their vital signs, the uh, things that you notice upon examination, uh, so any tests that you do diagnostically, all those things, health history, that you're asking the questions to the patient, they're not just offering it up. Those are all objective things. So you're, you're gathering information about the situation based upon the subjective findings that the patient told you. Assessment is taking all those things, all those facts, all those clues that you just got and creating a plan. This is the diagnostic uh, uh, aspect of this. This is, so you're fi figuring out what it is based upon the clues and the information that you just gathered. So that's the assessment, okay? The assessment would be the diagnosis. The plan is what you're gonna do about the diagnosis. So once you've established that the patient is a class three periodontal uh, patient, you know, now you're gonna talk about the plan. You're gonna be talking about SRP and what things are gonna be. So this is uh, your diagnosis. This can also be the treatment that is rendered that day. And so that can follow underneath this, this uh, under the plan aspect. So 
first off, you're going to be talking about what you're going to do, why you're doing it, you know, based upon the assessment. And then you're going to be talking about what you did. So then underneath that, you've got the treatment aspects, which are going to be, you know, the, the amount of uh, anesthetic that you used, you know, patient's health and reaction to different things, the materials that you used, the treatment that you provided, uh, specific tooth numbers, specific surfaces, all that kind of stuff that's in there, uh, how the patient was doing afterwards. You know, those are all great things to make sure that you're documenting. Nitrous and other sedation methods, you're absolutely making sure that you're including thorough, thorough documentation. No, there's no more uh, uh, sued thing uh, for dentists than it is when, when patients are sedated. They're getting in a car, they're driving home, uh, they're having after effects, they're, something like this. Um, they they tend to be litigious. So that's that's when that comes up. Make sure that you're documenting everything about what you gave, how long, what percentage, uh, how they reacted, how long afterwards did you give them oxygen? Did they come off of it? Were they clear-headed before they left? Who was with them? Who was with them in the room? Who came with them? Who left with them? All these kind of things need to be in there. Um, again, it's all outlined in our, 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 our documentation book. In addition to just SOAP notes, we also have to talk about informed consent. So informed consent has its own acronym, and that is PARC. PARC is the procedure, the alternatives, the risks, and questions. And so making sure that when you're getting informed consent, when it's appropriate, um, it needs to include these particular things. Most offices will have just a form. They're getting the patient to sign prior to doing treatment. It's going to talk about what the procedure is what the alternatives to treatment are. So you can talk about, you know, do you want the bridge? Do you want the implant? Do you want the uh, the removable? Uh, those are all alternatives. Um, risks, you need to be telling them about what the risks are and they have to be signing off on that. And then at least, you know, notate that they had the opportunity to answer questions, you know, that, you know, it was asked of the patient if they had any questions, they declined. Uh, that could be on there but it does need to, at least that the opportunity was given. So all those are part of proper informed consent that's going to hold up in court, okay? Seems like a lot, I know, uh, and I'm, I'm, this is less than an hour. I've thrown a lot of information at you. Uh, these are all things that we are happy to help you with. Uh, uh, E-Assist does a lot of this stuff for you when it comes to the claims themselves and the coding and all. Uh, if you're needing help with, with any of these aspects and you want to reach out to either Practice Booster, E-Assist, uh, or the other services that Henry Shine can offer to you, just contact your Henry Shine field service rep. Uh, they will hook you up with us. We'll make sure that, that uh, things are being done the way that they should be done. So one more time, we're going to talk about just streamlining your claims, clean claims. Uh, are going to make sure that you don't have denials and delays due to incorrect information. So uh, accurate claim submissions. We're going to make sure that your CDT coding is correct. We've discussed that pretty thoroughly at this point, that you've got all the documentation that you need, that all the proper attachments that are there. Uh, if anything is not there, if their social's off by one number, if their name is misspelled, if they've got the wrong employer down, it's going to get kicked back. Okay, and that costs you money. Anytime you're having to chase claims, chase money down, postpone payment, then uh, you're you're losing money, leaving money on the table. And oftentimes things are being denied that could have gone through the first time just fine. Uh, and then it's up to you to resubmit. Did you know that only 33%, a third of claims that are denied are ever appealed and insurance companies count on that sometimes denials will happen just because they're over there crossing their fingers and hoping that you won't appeal them they got a they got a two-thirds chance that you won't appeal if they deny so they'll deny so you should appeal okay and appeal correctly with the proper documentation everything that's that's there so um dental administrators within your office may not have a lot of time to do this so again, there's outsourcing, uh, there's, there's specialists who do this type of thing for your practice, making sure that you're doing it correctly. Um, 
proper claim handling. So again, you've got to send these clean claims within one business day of doing the treatment. Okay. This is how it should be done properly to make sure that things aren't getting delayed. You should be posting all the payments that you get, all the things that you've received from the insurance company should be posted to the ledger within a business day. Keeping up with that. Don't get behind and get backlogged on these things. You should be following up every 10 business days on any claims that have been out there more than a month. Not really a whole lot of uh, reason to do it prior to a month at that time. It may not even have had time to be processed, but if it's older than a month, um, you can create you what's called a one to 31 file. You've got, you've got uh, a list of uh, claims that you need to follow up. You put one in each one of those uh, days. And as, as the month goes, you go through, if it's the third, you go through the file number three and you call everybody that's in there that's still outstanding. And so, and then if the month rolls around again, you're back to three, you call them again. And so you're able to, every 10 business days, really you should be recalling on anything that's over 30 days old. You should be getting your insurance aging to zero and keep it there, okay? That means nothing should be outstanding over 90 days for certain, okay? Um, there ought to be a, you know, uh, in the high 90s, like 97% of uh, your uh, monies should be collected uh, in a reasonable period of time and not a whole bunch of stuff sitting out on your books. So these claim denials, it's causing you to lose a lot of revenue, okay? Average gross billings, and these numbers came from, this was from 2020, the ADA's Health Policy Institute uh, Survey of Dental Practices. Uh, the average dental gross billings, this was for a single doctor practice, and this is all from rural to to urban, so you're going to find something that may be lower than what you're expecting to see, but uh, 732,000. So 9%, most, most practices are leaving about 9% sitting on the table. That uncollected revenue, uh, on average, 9%, that's $66,000. So over a 40-year dental practice career, that's $2.6 million dollars of uh, uncollected revenue. That's revenue that's owed to you, but not collected. And think about this. This is not just, I mean, 9% sounds like a lot, but think of it this way. We're talking, that's pure profit. If uh, practice has 60% overhead and you got 40% uh, revenue, of that 40%, 9%, uh, which is basically, uh, it's 25% almost of your uh, pure revenue of your practice, you're leaving sitting on the table. Think of it that way. Okay. That's pure profit. Overhead's already gone. So that's, that's, that's money that could go straight into your pocket with nothing taken out of it. So that's eye opening. Once again, eAssist can help with so many of these services. We discussed this at the beginning. Uh, so outsourcing is one of these functions, it's just a simple way to keep your revenue consistent. Uh, and they can help you with all that billing, aging, claims, insurance verification, uh, and so forth. So as a bonus, you get our stuff. If you're an eAssist uh, client, you not only get uh, the, the wonderful services that eAssist is providing, Practice Booster is built in. You get uh, our online code advisor, which is essentially our coding with confidence manual in a database form that's searchable by keyword or index. Now, you can get this without being an ACS client directly by going to our website at practicebooster.com, but it comes as a part of uh, being an ESS client. So you get this, you're able to look up any code, find out the do's, the don'ts, the warnings, the uh, concerns, narratives, uh, uh, attachments, documentation, all that kind of stuff is in here uh, included with that. And so you're able to get all of our online resources. That also includes the digital copies of the Insurance Solutions newsletter going back three years. It's searchable. You will do a huge article on all the code changes to bone graphs and membranes, you know, or all whole sections on uh, uh, coordination of benefits. You know, we'll pick a topic and just do a deep dive into it. So really cool uh, access there. So. If you are interested in having someone contact you from eAssist, I'd love it if you could uh, 
pop up that next poll for me if you would. Uh, so if you're interested, just click yes. Uh, someone will uh, be happy to reach out to you and talk to you about this. Um, if not, that's okay too. Uh, that's fine, but keep us in mind for that particular thing. Uh, we can certainly help you at any time when you feel like you're ready. If, you've, if you lose someone off your admin team and you need some extra help, uh, it may be easier to consider outsourcing than it is to be finding a qualified replacement person. Um, so that's a, a way to take the pressure off your team. So going to give that up there for just a moment. Someone is at the front door. <laughs> Says Alexa. Forgive me, guys. All right, guys. That's been uh, long enough. Uh, let's let's take a look. I'm going to go through some Q&A. There's not a whole lot here to talk about. We've got just a few minutes left that we're going to go. And so um, curious about how much ESS charges. It's going to depend upon the size of your practice. I believe that uh, I was just at uh, an event for Henry Shines last week out in Vegas, where I spoke, uh, they were saying if your practice uh, is under a certain amount, they have a flat fee over that. It's like a three, 3.5%. I don't want to speak for them. This is something that you'd need to reach out directly to the ESIS team and uh, and find out about the charges uh, associated with, with what ESIS does. Uh, our stuff is flat feed. Uh, it's on our website at practicebooster.com for the coding resources and, and uh, uh, our uh, books and things like that. They're all in the store. But we do now have a, an ebook format also. So you've got the paper version, you've got the online database version of our code advisor, uh, and you also have an ebook version of all the books, including medical dental cross coding. A lot of people didn't even know we have that documentation, a technology book an administration book, which should be uh, an essential resource for training up anybody uh, who's on your admin team that want to learn how to do insurance verification, you turn to the chapter, you read about it. You want to learn how to work with Fed VIP plans, you can turn to the chapter, you can read about it. Uh, so very, very helpful. And then, of course, the Coding with Confidence book, which is uh, kind of a, the gold standard resource that uh, uh, will help you with your coding. So. Let's take a look. Will the recording be sent to us? Yes. Afterwards, uh, I don't remember. Uh, and Shirley, you may be able to answer that. I know that after the recording is, or the webinar is done, this should be being sent back out within the week. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct, Dr. Gromeyer. Over the coming week, um, everyone will receive, everyone registered whose emails we have will receive the link. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Share it with your friends. Share it with your family. Invite people over, like the old slideshows, you know, get the neighbors to watch us. Um, so any more questions concerning coding or any of the things that I've discussed today? All right, you're welcome. Got some thank yous coming in and things like that. Um, how far back can insurance goes when requesting charts? That's going to be plan dependent. Uh, and state dependent. So it depends upon your state laws and also whether those particular plans are self-funded or fully insured. Uh, there are two types of plans within your office. I'll cover this real quick. We don't have a lot of time left. Uh, there are two types of plans within your office, about 50-50. And you may be, you have a lot of state laws that are that are dictating what interests can and cannot do. Those only apply to the fully insured plans. And that's about half of the plans in your practice. State laws do not apply to self-funded plans. Those are federally governed. They are governed under uh, ERISA, the uh, Employment Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. So um, I'll tell you a little bit what, about what the difference is. A fully insured plan is a plan that is created by the insurance company uh, they set the rules, they design the plan, they sell it to small businesses and to individuals. They fund the pools of money that are used to pay claims. 
uh, and they are gathering, and that money comes from the payment of uh, premiums uh, to the insurance company. Those types of plans are governed by the insurance commissioner of your state. They fall under the state laws of your state, okay, including fee capping laws and things like that. They have to abide by those. Um, timely filing laws. There's a lot of laws that apply, but only to those fully insured plans. There's another whole half of, of uh, plans probably in your office that are called self-funded plans. Self-funded plans, like I said, are federal. They, they are nationwide, so they're going to be the big dogs. They're going to be Bank of America, Walmart, Google, uh, and, uh, uh, IBM, people that have uh, employees across the nation, perhaps across the world. Those types of employers they're not going to just buy a prepackaged plan. What they do is they design their own defined benefit plan, okay? They create the rules. They say, I want my employees to have this, this, and this. And, and uh, if they get a crown, here are the rules. And, and this is what I want to offer to my uh, uh, higher-ups. And here's what I want to offer to the guys that are in the warehouse. They may have multiple different plans uh, for different types of people within their organization. They then take a big lump of their own money and they put it into trust accounts. Uh, so they've got a big bank account and it's their money. It's Walmart's money sitting there, Bank of America's money, Google's money. It's not the insurance companies, okay? And then they will hire one of these insurance companies, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Delta Dental, uh, uh, there's any of the ones that you, that you know, United Concordia, whatever, it doesn't matter. Those guys just act as paper pushers, third-party administrators, TPAs, okay? And so all the insurance company does in that type of plan is they accept claims and they decide whether they should be paid or not. And they get paid, a, the insurance company gets paid a flat fee for looking at the claim, whether they accept or deny it. They have no financial interest in whether it gets paid or not because it's not their money paying the claims, okay? So the, plan, the, the, the times that they feel like a claim should be paid, they're going to tell, hey, Walmart, you need to pay this guy so much money. Hey, Bank of America, you need to pay this guy so much money. Now, the check's still going to come with the uh, insurance company's name on it. So it's kind of hard to tell these two types of plans apart. But they, uh, the self-funded plans, are not governed by the insurance commissioner. You can complain to the insurance commissioner all you want to about a self-funded plan. It doesn't do anything. You got to go to HR. You got to go to the company, tell the patient to go to HR and, and tell them you're having that they are having trouble with a particular plan. Uh, they don't have timely filing laws. They've got to tell you that they received the claim within a reasonable amount of time, which is usually like I think it's uh, 60 days or something, uh, but they don't have a particular time in which they have to pay the claim. I've seen claims on a self-funded plan go two years because the company didn't have the funds to fund the trust account that paid out the claims. And so if there's no money in the bank, the, the, the checks don't get written and it's perfectly legal to do so, okay? Now there is legislation actually happening right now that's going through nationally uh, and uh, that is potentially taking fee capping laws for non-covered services federal. And so by that being federal, it's going to cover both uh, self-funded and fully insured plans. Right now, those fee capping plans, if you're one of the 43 states that have fee capping laws in place, they only apply to the fully insured plans within your practice. They don't apply to the other half, the self-funded plans. Those may choose to go along with state laws. They may choose, but they don't have to. That's at their discretion. And so those are significant differences. So anything else, guys? Yeah, about self-funded and full, and hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully I did discuss self-funded and fully insured to your satisfaction. And soap note templates, yes, we do have those available. Uh, it's our, our dental uh, documentation with confidence manual. Uh, it's a book that's available on the Practice Booster website, practicebooster.com. And so those templates are there. Uh, you're able to, to, to use those and modify those to your uh, own usage. So 
Yeah, you're welcome. Absolutely. So happy to help you guys tonight. Uh, we've done our hour, gone a little bit over. I hope I've uh, covered a lot of material and sparked some interest in some other things. So 160 code changes. I covered like four. Uh, so there's so many more for you to go out and research. Make sure that you're updating your, your materials and your practice management software, that you're aware of what these codes are. Come listen to some of our seminars. Uh, get us to do a revenue enhancement one-on-one -on -one with you. Uh, if you'd like us to look at your particular office and your particular coding, happy to spend three full hours with you going over coding and admin stuff. Make sure that you're doing it correctly and rebalancing your fees while we're at it. We give you a new fee analysis. So happy to help you with all that. I've enjoyed this discussion this evening, and I hope to see you next time. Throwing back to you, Shirley. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Grobmeyer, for a wonderful presentation this evening, and thank you all for joining us tonight. We did record tonight's webinar, and we'll email the recording out sometime in the next week, as we said earlier, and we would appreciate your feedback via our survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Have a wonderful night.